Well, good morning, North Shore family. How is everybody doing? <laughs> Man, it's good to see those of you here in person. Uh, got lots of people coming in, uh, still some more to come. And I know we have some people out today and everything as well. Uh, so we say hello to you online. Thank you for joining us uh, in the way that you can. Um, we do love spending this time with you, uh, even if it's uh, virtually and not and not face to face. Um, man, it's just I'm excited for today for a couple of reasons. Obviously, we got the Super Bowl coming up, uh, and more importantly, it is Pastor Josh McClary's birthday. So, happy birthday to you, sir! Thanks for being born. We really appreciate it. <laughs> All right, we're gonna jump into some praise and worship uh, this morning. We're gonna sing some songs to just get our our hearts, our minds uh, set on the things of God, and uh, just ready to receive His word this morning. Uh, I would encourage you as you're able, if you want to stand, if you want to sit, you want to dance, you want to clap, uh, I just encourage you to sing out and uh, let the, the words of these songs just kind of penetrate your, your heart and um, just let them be a prayer uh, and connect you to God this morning uh, and just that he, we would welcome him in this place as we worship him. Amen. <laughs> Oh 
Man, it's good to know that we can take God at his word. What we read in the Bible, what we read when we are just spending time with God is true yesterday, today, forever. And it is just good to know that the promises that he has given us, we can count on them. Amen. be close, close to your side, so heaven is real, and death is a lie. I want to hear voices of angels above, singing as one. Power in hell. 
is great about worshiping the great I am, the God who created it all, the God who wrote his love letter to us so we could know him, is that because of who he is, we can stand on the promises that he has made to us. Amen? Standing on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages may his praises ring. Glory in the highest I will shout and see. Standing on the promises of God, Good morning, North Shore family. Glad to be with you this morning. We want to welcome those that are joining us online, the Snurbles, Lana and Dana, to Rita, uh, to Donna, uh, who's back in the hospital again, fourth surgery in three months. Uh, hopefully we'll get out soon, but this has just been a haul. And so uh, she's listening this morning, but praying for uh, Miss Donna, for, to Carl, my buddy, uh, to, to Maggie. God bless you all, and thank you for, for being uh, with us. On, on the table uh, this week uh, uh, starts off the Lenten season. Uh, just wanted to give you something to equip you, uh, and if you're online and would like for the same thing, just direct message me and I'll send it to you. A lot of people have questions. What does Lent mean? What, does, what is Ash Wednesday and all the different things? So I put a copy of that on your table just to kind of uh, get you started with that. If you've got any questions with that or uh, you want to talk more about it, my email's at the bottom. Shoot me a message and we'll talk more about it. But that kind of gets you uh, set up for it. Uh, the, the main thing that I would say uh, that I always kind of harp on as far as the Lenten season, if you'd like to participate, great. If you, you don't, it's not something that is in the Bible. However, it is followed by many traditions, including uh, our family, our St. Christopher family, and who, who will be doing a Ash Wednesday service. The main thing, it's not about what you give up. It's about what you put back in. Uh, and, and so that's the whole purpose is getting ready uh, for the, 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 the time of the resurrection uh, and celebrating that. So if you've got any questions with that, let me know. Uh, and there's other things on the table that you're welcome to, to keep and to, to have. This, mo this morning we're going to be talking about uh, really one of the 
uh, famous passages in the Bible where God calls himself the great I am and uh, looking forward to, to that. So if we pray together uh, and then we'll jump right back in. Uh, Lord, thank you for uh, a time just to pause and declare what you've said you are and just agree with it. Your nature and your character uh, as we sing these songs uh, just have a way of transforming my own heart and I say thank you for that. Uh, Lord, as we speak and as we uh, share these things that you have shared with us in this love letter, God, I pray that today you might just uh, really enlarge our view of you. Uh, and I will also say uh, I, I recognize that I don't know that I'll ever be able to wrap my mind fully around who and all that you are. I, I, I doubt it very seriously, uh, Lord, but I pray that you'd expand that today. Uh, that we would, would get a, a greater taste and a greater love and a greater appreciation and reverence and awe of who you really are. I, I thank you that you know uh, us right where we are, the things that we have going on, uh, the, our hurts and our needs, uh, our, our desires. And I just pray a deeper awareness of your presence right now. I pray for my sister Donna, who's just been going through a hard time with uh, surgery. I pray for your healing hand and your presence even uh, in that hospital room. And pray for George's mom and others uh, that are recovering this week. Um, Lord, we submit them to you. Lord, I pray for the other person that, that maybe just feels lonely today, uh, the person that feels uh, distant today and unsure of life today, uh, that might be struggling mentally. Uh, Lord, I pray that there be encouragement through these songs uh, in your word. You might show yourself strong. We say we love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Bigger than I thought you were 
Thank you for not being a limited God that we could even understand. We thank you, God, that you are beyond our comprehension. You are worthy to be praised because you are God and we are not. And we just love you so much. Yeah. 
worship your name it stands above them all jesus jesus your name is the highest your name is the greatest your name it stands above them all so much for singing with us. You may have a seat. God defines God. I want to trust God to define who he is. Have you noticed that we live in a day that people believe that they have the right to define who God is? Have you heard it in things like, well, surely God would save everyone. Have you heard it in things like, God would not have created these feelings in me if he didn't want me to express them. Have you heard it in things like people declaring that they are God's chosen person or they are God's chosen people or they are God's chosen candidate? Hello. Or they are God's chosen country? Really? Or maybe the biggest. Well, you just worship your way 
and I'll worship my way, okay? It's all good. What you see about all of these is they try to, if you will, wrap their mind or their, their, their hands around almighty, infinite, uncontainable God like he's a concept. And so in doing that, it's almost like we think we can bend him and shape him to be who and what we think it should be. Why don't we just trust God to define who God is? That's really what I want to talk about this morning. Genesis 1.26 declares, Then God said, Let us make man in our own image after our likeness. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created him. So whose image are we created in? God's. He defines who he is. He also defines us. Exodus chapter 3 begins to reveal the nature of who God is to his people. And so we jump right in and read from Exodus chapter 3, and it says this, An angel and the angel of the Lord appeared to him, Moses, in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. He looked, and behold, the bush was burning Yet it was not consumed. Now, just to wrap our minds around this, this would be in the middle of nowhere. You would see a normal bush. This was not a fancy bush. It was just a normal that fit the, the territory. Now, the bush was not on fire. So there was not something that was happening to the physical bush. There was something obviously supernatural happening because it was instead of the bush, but it Something was burning and creating its own, uh, and, and that's what really grabbed Moses' attention. It was burning from its own power, not the bush. Okay, uh, It reminds me of John chapter 1, verse 4 and 5. In him, Jesus, was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was something going on. Uh, and Moses didn't fully know or couldn't grasp it, but it was something to, to just move towards him. Uh, and this morning, regardless of where you are, regardless of how you feel your life of faith is, you know, one of the beautiful things that you and I can do is just take a step towards God. Uh, and you'll find he'll reveal more about who he really is. Uh, and it will be amazing, and it will be life-changing. It goes on. And Moses said, huh, I'm going to turn aside to see this great sight. Why is the bush not burned? I mean, it wasn't rocket scientists. He just took a step towards him. And when the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called. Did you get that? When the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called. I, I mean, there's something about you just go, all right, I'm going to take you at your word. I, I'm going to go ahead and lean into who you really are, and I'm just going to move my heart towards you, or I'm just going to surrender where I'm at towards you. Uh, and, and, and God starts moving. There is something about us just choosing uh, to take a step towards God. That's what he was doing. And as he did, God starts revealing more and more. And so God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. I don't know how it sounds, but that sounds cool. Uh, and he said, here am I, here am I. Then he said, do not come near, take your sandals off your feet. You know, I pause there just for a moment. I wonder how often We take advantage of God's holiness. I wonder in our intent of, of drawing near, we've tried to lower the beauty of Almighty Sovereign God. I, I wonder where we've just kind of given ourselves a pass and not just recognizing that he deserves ultimate reverence, uh, that he deserves ultimate uh, attention uh, and, and passion uh, and, and recognition for who he really is, that he, that he deserves ultimate reverence, that he deserves ultimate respect, that he deserves from me ultimate holiness uh, uh, and humility. We're talking about almighty God. 
You know, there's something about just even in that little statement that he says, draw near and just take your sandals off. There's just something about just a reverence for God and who he is. And God said, for the place which you are standing is holy ground. How do you know it's holy? Any place God is, is holy. And he shows up, it's holy. So that normal, everyday ground with God there, God's presence, it's, it's, it's holy. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. Now, it's important for us as we, we grab a hold of these patriarchal names uh, that, that uh, remind us of the lineage of these promises, that remind us of the, 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 the things that God's doing that he's promised not only uh, people way back then, but he brings forward into now. Were these perfect people? Did they have it all figured out? Did they have it all together? No. They were just ones that took steps towards God, and God blessed them and used them as a part of his plan. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. When we realize God's in the place, it demands a response. You know, I think of even how when Peter, in Luke chapter 5, when Peter came in contact with Jesus, and Jesus said, I need to use your boat uh, and, and push away from the shore uh, and speak to the people. Uh, and he did, and he got done. And he said, Peter, by the way, I know you've been fishing, uh, uh, and, and uh, you've been fishing all night, and you've caught nothing. And so you go to the other, can you push out to the water again? And, and Peter was going, well, because you asked me, then I will do it. Uh, and he gets this humility. Mungus, I mean, unbelievable load of catch of fish. And in that instant, he started to realize who was with him. God was there. And he says, depart from me, for, my, for I'm a sinful man, O Lord. There is something about just recognizing who God is. And it demands a response. It demands a response. It goes on, Exodus 3, 7. Then the Lord said, and notice all these things that God knows what's going on. I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt. I've heard their cry because of their taskmasters. He knows what's going on. I know their sufferings. I know. I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptian. He knows what's going on. He knows what's, what's in your heart. He knows your struggles. He knows everything that's going on. And to bring them up out of the land, to a good land and a broad land, God's always good, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of, and I interjected this part myself, of righteous judgment. Understand, there wasn't just a, I'm going to get these people ready to go somewhere. There wasn't just a, God's on mission to get Moses prepared and ready to do some deliverance. But also, God was doing some judgment in the land of Canaan, where he was doing righteous judgment on people, because that was his, his complete love and mercy justice of things that were coming on. And so what was going to happen? He's going to give them the land of... In righteousness, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Well, I've never heard of them. Exactly, because when God gives justice, it's full. And now behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me in the fullness. I've also seen the oppression which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come, and I'll send you. I'm going to send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. He ends with, come, I'm going to send somebody like you. Moses said, uh, <clears throat> who am I? Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children out of Israel? 
of Israel out of Egypt. Now, Moses obviously had a change of heart. He was from Egypt. He was born there, and he was raised in Pharaoh's palace, and he thought he was all that. And he took matters into his own hands, and he murdered someone, and he was, he's been in the land of Midian in the desert for 40 years, and so there's a humility now, but he thinks not just less of himself, he doesn't think anything of himself. And he's like, who am I? Who am I? And sometimes, and maybe you need to hear this today, sometimes the Lord just interrupts us in our own self-deprecating self. Do you know where you're just going, you're so dumb, you're so dumb, you're never going to, you know, I mean, that, that voice. And he said, but I will be with you. There's the game changer. I'll be with you. And this will be the sign for you that I have sent you. When you've brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this very mountain. Then Moses said to God, well, if I come to the people of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said, I am who I am. When you first read that, it's like, huh? <laughs> Can't you just give me a name? <laughs> God is declaring the nature and character of who he is to us in that moment. I am who I am. He's trying to say, I, I have been who I've always been. Uh, you don't define me or shape me. I'm telling you who I really am. I'm pulling back and letting you see almighty, righteous God who loves and wants a relationship with his creation. Reminds me, Hebrews 13, 8. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. I'm not, he said, I'm not shaped by others. I am is the ultimate statement of self-sufficiency, uh, the ultimate statement of self-existence, the ultimate statement of immediate presence. He's just saying, no, no, I am. That's why God's promises are true, because the I am is able to make and keep all his promises. He said, say this to the people of Israel. I am has sent you, sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say this to the people of Israel, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to, to you. This is my name forever, and thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. What a beautiful passage uh, as we lean into God's word uh, and we get to allow him to define who he is to us. Uh, and then really the call to us is will you just trust that? We just trust him to define who he is. Now, I want to lead us down a, a, a road where he gives us through this text some guides for trusting who he really is. Uh, and it allows us to lean in uh, to him uh, and to, to, to love him for who he really is. By this passage, we can learn, and these are some theological terms we can lean into this morning, God is transcendent. God is above us. I mean, no matter how good you think you are, God is always above us. He's beyond us. He's exceeding all limits. Stephen Lawson says, the holiness of God conveys his exalted transcendence. I mean, have you ever been even close to holy? I mean, God is holy, not just part of the time. He's holy all of the time. God is above us, beyond what we can contain, beyond what we can describe, beyond, I think, even in heaven, we'll be able to wrap our minds around because he is uncontainable, almighty, infinite God. I think one of the beauties of heaven is I'm going to get to be trying to understand more and more about him, and there's always going to be more, and it's always going to be good, and it's always going to be life-sustaining. It's always going to be amazing and great and holy, and I'll just love him even that much more and more and more. God is transcendent. He's far above and beyond us. He's exceeding all limits. He's bigger than you thought. 
You go, wow, I mean, my, my brain's been stretched by that. He's bigger than you thought. He's bigger than you thought. He is the sovereign, self-defining one. Many of the Psalms have tried to, if you will, express this. Uh, and just when, when they get the joy in their heart to where they just got, I've just got to write about this. I've just got to declare this. Psalm 99. The Lord reigns. Let the peoples tremble. He sits enthroned upon the cherubim. Let the earth quake. The Lord is great in Zion. He is exalted over all the peoples. Let them praise your great and awesome name. Holy is he. I'm going to read you more. The king in all his might loves justice. You have established equity. You have ex executed justice and righteousness in Jacob. Ex exalt the Lord our God. Worship at his football, footstool. Holy is he. I got football in there. Uh, Moses and Aaron were among his priests. Samuel also was among those who called upon his name. They called to the Lord and he answered them. In the pillar of the cloud, he spoke to them. They kept his testimonies and the statutes that he gave him. O oh Lord, our God, you answered them. You were a forgiving God to them, but an avenger of our wrongdoings. Exalt the Lord our God and worship at his holy mountain. For the Lord our God is holy. Woo! -hoo! Sorry. Couldn't help it. Don't want to help it. Our God is transcendent. It's important for us to understand, we can never pull him down. We can never go up to a level that he is. He is almighty God. He is transcendent. There's another guide that I think, if we kind of keep in our, our minds, this kind of kind of put, put on one side, uh, he's transcendent. Uh, another, I would say that God is imminent. God is imminent. He is among us. I think of the term described for Jesus. He's Emmanuel, God with us. Now, there's a couple of terms that are close to that. Not imminent with an E, meaning superior, although he is superior. Uh, not imminent with an I, which means he's happening soon, like imminent danger, although I do believe he's coming soon, imminently. I'm, I'm talking about imminent. He is among us. Stephen Lawson again said, because God is without physical body, he is imminent among us. He is always near. He transcends all limitations of space, and he is present in every place with all that he is. Existing without spatial restrictions, God can always be near with his entire being. That's why I think we link on to Psalms, uh, like Psalm 23, verse 4. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you're with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Why? Because God is imminent. He is among us. Or the end of the Great Commissions, Matthew 28, 20, Jesus said, Lo. I am with you always to the very end of the age. Why? Because he is with us. He's among us. Now, eminence is a distinctly Christian way of understanding. And in fact, we get to see all around us things that twist and do not have a correct understanding of God. Maybe you've seen uh, somebody that refers to something from a pantheistic or a deistic belief system uh, in how they relate to creation. Pantheists believe everything is part of God. And so if we've got our, our, our guardrail of transcendence and our guardrail of eminence. He is above us and yet he is among us. And so how, how do pantheists get that out of whack? Well, they think that he is among us, but he's just not above us. And so they think everything is God. You've seen it like in things like Avatar. What is that? It's a pantheistic worldview. It's an incorrect view of God. 
Or maybe you've seen a a deist point of view. They believe God is separate, but not active. And what have they done? They think he is above us, he's separate from us, that he's just holding things at an arm length. He is not among us. He's, you know, he created it, but then he's just kind of doing his own thing. There was a term uh, coined in 2005 in a book that was actually written on teenagers, but yet I find it's one of the predominant ways that people believe even now. It's called moralistic therapeutic deism. Mouthful. What do they believe? They believe that God exists who created and ordered the world and watches over it high above the earth from a distance. And God wanted people to be good and nice and fair to each other. And so he taught in the Bible and by most world religions. And so the central goal of life is to be happy and to feel good about oneself. And God does not need to be particularly involved in one's life except when God is needed to resolve a big problem. And last thing, all good people go to heaven when they die. See, that's a twisted view of God. And see how people kind of grab spiritual elements and they grab things that they would prefer and try to twist that together and go, well, let's based on that. Gotta be careful about that. God defines God. Why is that so important? If God defines God, we can rest in his love and stand on his promises. So yet I, I try to Allow myself to understand that, yes, he is above me, and yet he chooses to be among us. He's God. Romans 8, starting in verse 31. What then shall they say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us. How will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is it to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who is raised? Who is at the right hand of God? Who is indeed is interceding for us? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation Stress, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, sword. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loves us perfectly. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. God defines God so we can rest in his love and stand on his promises. You can choose to try to be in control, though. You can still choose to try to be in control, and you will experience the things of the flesh. We talk often about if you're in Christ, then you're going to be, you're going to be understanding and you're going to be uh, having the fruit of the Spirit in you, like love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and self-control. What if you just choose to follow your own path, to, to have your own way of control? You understand that that also produces things within you. And so if you see these things, what does it mean? You may need to do a little checkup on things uh, because you might have inadvertently tried to define God in a way other than who he really is. Are you feeling anxious? Angry? Depressed? In debt? Never satisfied? Hypocritical? Doubting, exhausted, hopeless. It's time to let God define God and just rest. K. 
cast all that you have going on and rest in his love for you and stand on his promises today. Let's let God define God. Let's pray together. Lord, I just say thank you. Then you're that you are bigger than I could ever imagine or think. Even as I, 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 I grow more and more in love with you, there's always more. I thank you that you both are above what I can think of, and yet you are leaning into me even in this moment. And that I can lean on the promise that your word goes out and it accomplishes everything for which you have sent it uh, and never returns void, Isaiah 55, 11. I pray for my family, those here, those connecting online. I pray that you would help us to see more of who you really are and just respond to you with a yes, that we would find moments to rest in your love and stand on your promises for your glory. You are who you said you are. We glorify that. We say we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. So we remind you, there's always some next steps. You know, it's never just uh, take this message and good luck and go watch the Super Bowl, even though that would be good. Go watch the Super Bowl. Uh, There's always a next step. Uh, And so whether that for you in this moment is to rededicating your heart to God, uh, that would bless his name. Maybe you need to be encouraged by some of the habits. Again, those are online uh, and uh, serving in and throughout the church. And we thank you for for, uh, doing that uh, even this this week. Um, We had our first Wednesday uh, service this last week. And thanks for those that participated in that. We'll be doing that again next month, the first Wednesday, we meet at 6.30 on here. Uh, This week, our midweek thing is um, going to be groups again. Uh, And so all of our groups will be meeting in different spots. Guys will be meeting on Tuesday night this week, Tuesday night uh, at 6 uh, at McAllister's. The ladies are going to be at 6.30 on Thursday at McAllister's, and youth will be 6.30 at Chick-fil-A. Uh, and, and so we're hitting up all the restaurants, uh, but it gives us a chance to gather together and encourage each other. The guys, uh, there is a book, um, Disciplines of a Godly Man, and we're going to be talking about the next set of chapters on that. So if you would like a copy of that, get in touch with me and I'll email that to you. Uh, but that's coming up. Right now we're going to finish up tonight, or today, this morning, uh, and just have a few minutes to where we talk about this. And uh, so we'll sign off for those online uh, and say, we love you, God bless, and we'll be in touch. For those of us here, I'm going to give you a chance. We're going to kind of link up into a couple of different groups. and.